we're going to explore the epistle to the Hebrews. And uh, I think it's fair to say that this is probably the most misunderstood book in the New Testament. I think there are passages in it that have no less than 16 different views expressed by competent commentators. Um, and yet, it, even though it's called the riddle book of the New Testament, if we go at it with an open mind and with very careful hermeneutics, theories of interpretation, I think you'll be surprised how it will just unfold and be clear. Not only to understand the book, but I think we'll also understand why it is that the majority of readers are confused by it. So that's our challenge. And we are in the first session of the book of Hebrews. If you look at the New Testament, of course, you have five Gospels, as I would look at them. I consider Acts, in effect, a fifth Gospel. You have 13 epistles that are assigned by the Apostle Paul. And you have eight that are called the Hebrew epistles. And uh, then, of course, one prophetic book at the end, the Revelation. And uh, the two pivotal epistles, major doctrinal epistles, are the book of Romans, of course, and the book of Hebrews, the one that we're going to undertake here. The, uh, seven, the, the, seven, of the seven of Paul's letters were to seven churches, which is interesting because they parallel the seven kingdom parables of Matthew 13. And there are three pastoral epistles, epistles written not to churches but to pastors, to Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. But we're in the... Uh, and by the way, three of the church epistles are called the prison epistles because he, he was on house arrest, but he did, did it from Rome during that time. But in this, these Hebrew Christian epistles, we have the book of Hebrews that we're going to focus on. Now, and we'll learn some surprising things about that. Not one of the eight so-called Hebrew Christian epistles are addressed to a church. That's going to be very significant, I think. It's not addressed to the church, it's addressed, but it's very important to understand who it is addressed to. Because unless you understand who it's addressed to, you're going to misunderstand a lot of things about it. It is littered with some very disturbing warnings, which seem, on the face of them, to contrast with some of the assurances of the church epistles. There are passages in Romans 8 that would seem to be just in juxtaposition or opposed to Hebrews 6 and, 6 and 10, which are known widely as the two problem chapters in the Bible. Ephesians 2 and Philippians 1 seem to be in contrast to 2 Peter 1 and so forth. But this whole book is widely misunderstood and we're not going to go backwards, we're going to go forward. It's going to reach out further than most people have any idea. That's the exciting news. Now, this is going to be what some people would call a tour de force in Christology. You're going to get a sweep, a grasp of who Jesus Christ really is. Mel Gibson's movie, a marvelous piece of work in many respects, is tragic in two respects. It's tragic in that it paints the crucifixion as a tragedy, when it actually was an achievement planned before the foundation of the world. But the second thing is he doesn't get across who the person of Jesus Christ is. This epistle is going to change that. It is also going to focus on a topic that you rarely hear preached from pulpits. Yet it's one of the most frequent uh, 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 topics of both our Lord and, and in the epistles. Our inheritance as believers and the risk of forfeiting it. Many people confuse the possibility of losing your inheritance with your loss of salvation. They're not the same thing, and that's what we want to get clear before we even get into the epistle. This is going to challenge each of, our, each, each of us in the field of soteriology. That's the fancy theological word for the study of salvation. What's it all about? Most people, I believe, have no grasp of what goes on to be saved. We all have heard the evangelist call down a decision for Christ. You go down the sawdust trail and make a decision, and we celebrate that as if it's a climax. No, it's a starting gun. 
We're going to talk about soteriology, strange enough. One of the things that surprised me as I really got into this was its implications on eschatology. I never really thought of the book of Hebrews as a prophetic book. First and second, th first and second Thessalonians, of course, and many others. But we're going to be in for some surprises. There is more prophecy about the millennium than there is in any other period of time in the Bible. There's more prophecy about the millennium. Most people think that the millennium is confined to one chapter in the book of Revelation. Chapter 20 and that's it. There's more prophecy cover to cover in the Bible about the millennium than there is about any other period of time in history. And no wonder it is so timely for us right now to really understand this book. I want to say right up front, I'll make reference to it all through the talk, that uh, I am at great benefit by the tireless research of my wife. She has poured through over 50 major works that deal with these topics. And I'm the benefit of the, the perspectives that have come out of that research that I would not have had any other way. And so this is a, uh, this, uh, those of you that may have seen our previous pr publications in Hebrews will see much of it that's familiar, of course, but you'll also see a fresh new look. And that's uh, about many topics, most of which I really am indebted to my, my incredible bride, who is doing a book on uh, the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And that kingdom is the millennial kingdom. And the power is becoming an overcomer, which is really what Hebrews is all about. And so I'm a beneficiary of some incredible commitment on the part of my wife. So we're both doing materials in this area. And uh, so watch for the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Soon to be on your neighborhood newsstands. Okay. Okay. Epistle of the Hebrews. It's one of the two greatest theological treatises in the New Testament, the first being Romans, of course. Israel, incidentally, is not one of many nations. Israel is treated in the Bible in contrast to the nations. It's interesting that there were 70 that went down to Egypt as a family, came out as a nation. And that's juxtaposed against 70 nations detailed in Genesis 10. The parallelism is very intentional. But it's not a subset, but Israel is a contrast and a focus. We're going to discover that the writer to the Hebrews leans heavily on the failures of Israel nationally so that we might avoid those. To the Greek mind, prophecy is prediction and fulfillment. Prediction and fulfillment, that's a Greek model. The Hebrew model of prophecy is prophecy's pattern. And they lean heavily in the rabbinical writings on looking at God's patterns, especially in their dealings with Israel. There's a deliberate parallel between what happens to Israel and the Messiah. They're always in parallel. That's why some people call this book, the book of Hebrews, the Leviticus of the New Testament. That's a book that you don't read, you study. Reading Leviticus is tedious, all that detail. But it's enriching if you take the trouble to dig in and study the book. Big difference. You're going to discover that Christ supersedes and fulfills almost everything in Judaism. The erotic priesthood is highly elaborated on. There's many other issues. You need to understand the reader. He's Jewish. This is a Jewish reader. It's a Jewish believer. Understand the predicament that guy had while the temple was still standing. There's lots of evidence that this was written just before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Visualize the predicament of a Jewish Christian. Their divinely appointed rituals in a divinely appointed place by divinely appointed people that he has to leave and reject and turn to this new idea. Tough spot. And by doing so, he gets ostracized from his family, from everybody around him. There was a lot of persecution. Understand his predicament. That's to whom this letter is written, primarily. Not only, but primarily. The Jewish dilemma, a divinely appointed religion, divinely appointed priests officiating divinely appointed temple, accomplishing divinely ordered services, ennobled through centuries. Understand the inertia here. How could believing priests and Pharisees remain 
In their words, zealous of the law. They're not supposed to, according to Galatians, right? It was the Jewish religious world that crucified Jesus and was repudiating him. So, the church in Jerusalem had already lost Stephen, first martyr. James was killed in 70, 62. We think it was between that window that this was probably written. And they all lost others in Acts 8 and 26 and so on. The churches in Galatia, special, singled out in the epistle to the Galatians. Many of these believers were tempted to resort to apostasy, maybe just temporarily, to get out from under the persecution. That's not an option. That's part of the message. But it's, a, in my opinion, a small part of the message. A key part, but a small part. The author has been greatly disputed, and I'll come to that in a minute. But what is the author's objectives? Number one, to combat apostasy. That's in chapter 2 and 10 especially. To encourage the reader to press on to spiritual maturity. That's the, you, the part you and I are going to focus on. And to comfort them in their persecutions. That's the purpose of the letter. What is his method? He is going to demonstrate using the Old Testament alone. He is going to focus entirely on the, from Old Testament references how the Messiah is superior to virtually everything in Judaism, but focusing on the three main pillars of Judaism. Angels, Moses, and the Levitical priesthood are going to be singled out where the Messiah is superior to and the fulfillment of all three of those. And that may not be a big issue for you and I, unless you're Jewish, but for them it was a big deal. But the lessons for us are going to prove astonishing. Now it's interesting that the writer, as he goes through that, that methodology, he's going to deviate from his logic to include five warnings. There are five major warnings. And those warnings are widely misunderstood by the casual reader unless they understand who is the reader and what are the issues being addressed. Don't take them out of context. So the Epistle of Hebrews, all about Christ, the new and living way. The first few chapters are going to be about Jesus. He's a new and better deliverer than anything available in Judaism. Better than the angels, better than Moses, a leader better than Joshua, a priest better than Aaron. That's the flavor of those first few chapters. Then he goes on to the whole issue of the cross. There's a new and better covenant that offers better promises than the law, offers a better sanctuary than the, t the tabernacle or the temple ever did offer. There are lessons there, but they've been superseded. Sealed by better sacrifice than all the sacrifices throughout history were simply echoes in advance of the one on the cross. And of course it achieves better results, and we'll talk about that. Then the final chapters go into faith, the faith walk, and how it's a true and better response than keeping the law, and then it's parting words. That's a quick snapshot of the epistle. The riddle of the New Testament. The authorship is anonymous. It wasn't signed. And the library is full of commentators with conjectures about who wrote the book. There are all kinds of people that just presume Paul couldn't have written it, and they have some reasons why they think that. And they have other suggestions. We'll explore those briefly. Was it written by Paul? Or was it written by Apollos? Or Barnabas? There are major Bible scholars that support these views, or try to. Now, the, we know a lot about the author. The author clearly had a vast knowledge, knowledge of the Old Testament. Uh, he obviously was a Hellenistic Jew, a Greek-trained Jew, writing to Jewish believers who were under much persecution. That's obvious from the letter. No, no contest there. The issues that are joined include the nature of the warnings. That's going to be one of the problems, to understand what are those warnings, these five warnings all about. To whom were they addressed? And the dangers presented for not persevering. This is about persevering. This is all about finishing well. This is not an epistle that leads some to Christ. This assumes you've already accepted Christ. This is not an evangelistic epistle. It's one about finishing well. This is not about the starting gun. This is about the finish line. That's what it's all about. Now, who wrote the book of Hebrews? It's an unsigned book. Why? Turns out there was a good reason why it wasn't signed. 
And that reason is going to be useful to every one of us in this room. There are many theories, and I'll tell you candidly, I have some strong beliefs, and I'm going to express those beliefs, but I also want you to understand this is one view, and it's not, not everybody's in agreement with what I'm about to tell you. I'll tell you what I believe, and I'll show you why I believe it. I can't prove who wrote it. I obviously believe it's Paul, and I'll show you why. But there are good scholars who don't think so. Was it Apollos? Was it Barnabas? Priscilla? Priscilla, that's one of the conjectures that you hear a lot, or Paul himself. Well, Apollos. Some people feel that Apollos could have written the book of Hebrews. The problem with that view is there's no evidence for it. It's a conjecture you find in the literature, but there's no evidence to support it. In fact, Apollos was from Alexandria. And the, in, in, even in Alexandria, they associated, in the earliest days, the book with Paul. So if Apollos wrote it, he couldn't convince his hometown. Okay, so it's a small point, but the main point, there's no evidence for it. What about Barnabas? There's some uh, uh, that ascribe it to Barnabas, but again, there's no evidence in support of it. That, uh, these are just conjectures. There were circulating some spurious writings that were attributed to Barnabas that were discredited. But even if they hadn't been, the point is the style of those would-be Barnabas letters is totally different than the style of the book of Hebrews. So there isn't, not only is there no evidence for it, there's some suggestive evidence against it. Brought about Priscilla, the wife of Aquila. But here again, there's no evidence. Timothy is recorded as Paul's amanuensis in, Tim, in, in his letters. Where's the evidence that there was any assistant other uh, uh, than Timothy? None. Timothy was intimate with Paul, and Tim Timothy is implied to be intimate with the author of Hebrews, as an aside. Okay. Now, there are many style reasons that I... B People say, well, it's not Paul's style. Wrong. It is Paul's style. I'll show you why. Um, many reasons. Peter, in fact, virtually states it as a fact. If we look at 2 Peter 3, starting at verse 15, this is from P uh, P uh, Peter's second epistle. Peter says, in an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given to, unto him, hath written unto you. Now you need to understand, the second epistle of Peter was written to Jewish believers. So Peter is indicating that these readers have a letter from Paul. So if Paul didn't write the book of Hebrews, there is an epistle of Paul that is lost. And many scholars hold the view that that's impossible, that God preserved the canon. Okay? It's another case that if, 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 Paul, if, if there's a pistol lost, we have another new name for God again. Butterfingers. I'm being facetious, of course. Hebrews. 1 Peter 1 and 1 Peter he wrote to... He, uh, he, it was his mission to speak to the Hebrews. Paul and Peter divided it up. Paul went to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jew. He goes, and all his epistles, speaking of Paul, of this, this is Peter talking about Paul, and in all his epistles, Paul's epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some are some things hard to be understood. <laughs> Peter had trouble following some of Paul's logic. And he's probably talking about Hebrews 6, which we'll get to later. Which they are unlearned and unst unstable rest, and they also, uh, the other scriptures to their own destruction. Another phrase here not to miss. Peter calls Paul's letters scriptures. Scriptures. Peter didn't use that casually. He is regarding the writings of Paul as scripture. There are many messianic groups. Christians that have gotten into the, into the Jewishness of the Old Testament. And uh, fellowship after some of those styles. That have, uh, they don't take Paul seriously. Because Paul keeps pointing out that we're not under the law anymore and that they, these people like to be under the law, it turns out. And so they don't, this, this, this is a refutation of some of their views. Paul's writings are regarded by Peter as, script, as uh, scriptures. Second Timothy, Paul said, all scripture, most of it? No, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's a very strange word in the Greek. It actually means God breathed. Letter by letter. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable 
for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Those are four things. They're, they're profitable for doctrine. What is doctrine? It tells you what's right. What's reproof? That tells you what's not right. For correction, how to get it right. And, and for instruction, how to stay right. Okay? I find those four labels useful. Doctrine, reproof, instruction, correction, and instruction is easy to memorize in the Bible verse. What does it mean? Well, practically, doctrine tells you what's correct. Reproof tells you what you need to fix. Correction is how you get it right. And instruction, how to stay right. I think that's useful. hope it's useful. But continue with the passage in Peter. Peter can just finish that off. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things be before, beware... Lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. This is Peter talking. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? Lest being led, led away with the error of the wicked, you fall from your own steadfastness. Superficially, that might be picked by someone to say you could lose your salvation. That's, a, that's an issue we need to resolve right early. Fall from your steadfastness. Fall from what? Your, your salvation? Become a non-saved? No, that's not what he's talking about. But apparently you can fall and miss the mark. We'll get to that later. Paul's writing this letter, I believe, and when one understands the forgeries that were circulated about the Thessalonian letters then there are several passages, when you understand that they were forgery, you won't understand 2 Thessalonians until you realize it's a response to a forgery that Paul talks about. Okay? Once you understand that, several passages start to make more sense. And at the end of that letter, Paul includes a sort of private mark, a personal token, so that they would know it came from Paul. He not only signed it, the secretary wrote it, but he signed it with his hand, and he included something that they would recognize as his token, as his fingerprint, as his style. It closes in 2 Thessalonians 3.17, The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Notice he's emphasizing that he signed this by his own hand. Okay, And he would also include a private mark at the end, so they would know it was from him. You ready for the private mark? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And you say, well, come on, Chuck. That's no big deal. That's in all the letters. No, it isn't. It's only in Paul's letters. No other writer in the New Testament uses that word. This is a signature item included in virtually every letter. And we go through them all. I won't, I'll spare you that. You can check it out yourself. Every one of these, Paul's epistles, closes with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Well, how does the book of Hebrews end? Now, I, I take that as being significant. Grace be with you all. Amen. Why is this impressive? Because the word grace does not even appear in any other epistle except one. Peter does make a reference to it, but it's not in a salutation. It's used in an exhortation, not in the salutation, as a style item, in other words. It's interesting, in Romans 8, you may recall, Paul lists a number of things that cannot separate you from the love of Christ. He lists seven things and then adds ten more for 17. In Hebrews, he does the same thing again. We find a similar list in chapter 12. There are seven things and then ten more. That same pattern. And by the way, he does the same thing in Galatians 5. Romans, he Hebrews, and Galatians have the same structural style, but there's far more than that coming. Paul uses the Greek word huios as sons rather than the similar Greek word technon, which other writers use, which actually means children. Paul uses sons rather than children. It's an equivalent term. It's a style. It's strictly a style issue, but that's Paul's style. The doctrine discussed in Romans 8.16 and Hebrews 10.15 are collinear. The doctrines discussed in 1 Corinthians 3 and Hebrews 5 are collinear. The writer says, pray for us. Doesn't sound significant, does it? Except there's, he is the only one epistle writer that makes that statement. Only Paul, in his letters, says, pray for us. Not a big deal. It's strict, I'm strictly not talking doctrine here, just style. But it's interesting the style fits. 
Okay, there's a bigger issue. In the main epistles, we find there is an emergent phrase from Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by faith. And we discover that the book of Romans is a description of who the just are. And Galatians explains how they shall live. And the book of Hebrews on that they shall live by faith. What I'm pointing out to you here is that this phrase out of Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith, the just is defined by Romans. It tells who the just are. And it's quoted in Romans 1.17. How shall they live? They shall li how they, that's what Galatians is all about, and it's quoted in Galatians 3.11. And the final one, by faith, is Hebrews 11 is the great hall of faith in the Bible. And just prior to that chapter starting in Hebrews 10.39, again we have this same Habakkuk 2.4. And that, of course, this suggests to me, that at least implies, that all three letters were written by the same guy. They are a trilogy amplifying the just shall live by faith. And that phrase, that cornerstone, became the battle cry of the Reformation. And Paul's letters are behind it. You say, well, gee, Chuck, then that doesn't prove that one author wrote all three. If Paul didn't write Hebrews, there's even a bigger miracle because the Holy Spirit orchestrated whoever it did, so it would be part of this trilogy. So that's even a bigger miracle than I'm suggesting. So, okay. In chapter 13 of Hebrews, there's a reference that the writer of the epistle was, was accompanied by Timothy. And we know that Timothy accompanied Paul all through several of his, uh, of his passages. We do not have any record of him accompanying anybody else. That doesn't mean that he exclusively accompanied Paul, but we do not have any evidence of him accompanying anybody else. So again, there's no evidence. For, so, why? so if Paul did write the book of Hebrews, why would he keep it anonymous? It was recognized by the first century church why he didn't sign it. His primary mission was as an apostle to the Gentiles, not the Jews. Whenever he spoke to the Jews, there was a riot, right? The, the, the Roman soldiers had to arrest him to protect him from the, from the, the mobs. Yet he had this deep burden for his brethren. When you look at Paul's life, you can expect that sooner or later he would write an epistle to his, from his own heart to his own people. But whenever he tried to address them, there'd be riots. The Jews were violently prejudiced against his ministry. He was hated by the Jews because he converted to Christianity. He was, they reputed his apostleship and led riots and so forth. But they also feared his attack against their ancient rituals and ceremonies. Because he's saying things that was not popular to the Jew. He never recovered the confidence of the, Jew, the Jewish side. And of course, he was also distrusted by many of the Christians because they remembered when he, as Saul, murdered them. Unlike his other epistles, nowhere in the book of Hebrews does Paul assert or defend his apostleship. Because that's not an issue. We know the reader, by the way, knew who the author was. He didn't sign it because he's not doing anything but expressing logic from their own scriptures. The book of Hebrews will stand or fall on the application of of very critical verses all through the Old Testament making his point, not because of any authority he has. So he doesn't defend his apostles. You can see he builds his entire thesis on Jewish arguments from the Old Testament passages. He exalts Christ, not his own apostleship. And it's based entirely on the Old Testament. And by the way, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the, the Septuagint. And... Uh, I've come to the conclusion that Paul's not signing it is deliberate in order to eclipse any anti-Pauline prejudices of the Judaizers. Even today, we've got fellowships around that love Christ, but they're all caught up in trying to keep the Torah. And uh, they have a, to get around an anti-Pauline prejudice, even today. The fact that Paul wrote uh, 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 Hebrews is incidental. It's at best a footnote, one way or the other. Okay?
Because there is an issue in Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9. Those that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. We need to understand what that's all about. Now, there are reasons that the text could not, that we could infer that the book is probably written before Paul's first imprisonment, but before his, after his first imprisonment, before his second. And uh, it's clearly written before the, seven, the fall of the temple in 70 AD. And uh, that may have been one of the reasons that the epistle was written, to encourage those that were having difficulties before the temple fell. And so, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. And to them that are without the law, as without the law. Now Paul will play whatever role it is in order to win whoever it is to Christ. To a Jew, he'll be a Jew. To those that are under the law, he'll be under the law. Those that are not under the law, he's not under the law. He'll do all he cares about is getting them to the Lord Christ. But the law of God, I might gain them that are without the law. I became uh, uh, to the weak, I became as weak that I might gain the weak. I made I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. The word partaker there is koinonos. Partaker. But the Lord said unto him, No, this is in Acts chapter 9, Damascus Road, Paul is blinded, Ananias is take, instructed to, to deal with it by the Lord. The Lord said unto Ananias, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, God speaking, to bear my name before the Gentiles and to kings and the children of Israel. This gives Paul a mandate to write the Hebrews. If, now, the early church fathers, Clement of Rome, in the first century, copiously uses the book of Hebrews, adopting its words just as he does the other books of the New Testament, treats it as scripture. And uh, as our epistle claims authority on part of the writer, Clement's adoption of it extracts from its virtually sanctioning its authority, and this is in the apostolic age. So no doubt of its canonicity is what I'm trying to get at here. Clement of Alexandria expresses, uh, refers it expressly to Paul, the authority of... Uh, uh, Pantanus, uh, chief of the catechetical school in Alexandria. And I think that's interesting, it's all in the Alexandria, which is, which is where Apollos came from, by the way. Saying that as Jesus is termed uh, in it, the apostle sent to the Hebrews, Paul, through humility, does not in it call himself an apostle of the Hebrews, being an apostle of Galatians. In other words, Jesus is regarded as the apostle of the Jews, so Paul is not about to intrude on that office. That's his point. Eusebius writes about all of this in the first uh, uh, about 150 AD. And as the epistle of the Hebrews, he, Clement, he's, re he's referring to Clement, says that it's Paul's, but that it was written to the Hebrews in the Hebrew language and that Luke translated carefully and published it to the Greeks. That consequently that there is found in the same color with regard to style in this epistle and the Acts, but it is not prefaced by Paul the Apostle with good reason. For, says he, as he was sending it to the Hebrews who had conceived a prejudice against him and suspected him, he very wisely did not repel them at the beginning by appending his name. That makes sense, even today. And he continues, then he goes on to say, But, as the blessed presbyter before now used to say, Since the Lord was sent to the Hebrews as being the apostle of the Almighty, Paul, out of modesty, and having been sent to the Gentiles, does not inscribe himself apostle of the Hebrews, both because of the honor due to the Lord, and because of its being a work of supererogation, in other words, assuming a, uh, uh, an office you don't deserve, uh, that, the, that he wrote also to the Hebrews being herald and apostle of the Gentiles. So that's the early church father's point of view. Let's set that all aside. Let's talk about who the readers are. We know they were Jewish. The quotations from the Old Testament settles any argument for a Jewish audience. They were Jewish believers. The main danger the author warns against is that going back to Judaism. The author clearly treats them as believers. He calls them brethren. He calls them beloved. They're partakers in the heavenly calling. They're partakers of Christ, of the Messiah. And certain words as falling away due to an evil heart of unbelief and hardening of the seatless of sin are only applicable if the readers are believers. So we need to understand right up front throughout this whole book, we're talking about believers. There are many people that try to twist some of the service and say, well, they maybe weren't really saved. That does violence to what the text says. These were believers. We need to understand that. It'll make the whole thing suddenly become very clear. Continue. They, like the author, were second generation believers, united by the us in uh, Hebrews ch uh, chapter 2, and distinguished from those who were eyewitnesses. In other words, they were believers, but not eyewitnesses is the point. 
And so is so is Luke and Paul, by the way. They, um, they have been believers for a long time and should now be teachers of the word, the writer admonishes. So these were people that should have been mature, is the point. This is written not only to believers, but believers that Paul feels they should be by now more mature than they are. And uh, although they've been believers for a long time, they have made, uh, remained spiritually immature and have not progressed in the faith. That's really the thrust of the whole message. Readers are the wavering in their faith because of persecution, and they are readers who know the author. This is a very key point in chapter 13. We'll discover that the readers knew who the author was, even though it wasn't signed. That's telling. That's interesting. The occasion, of course, is that it was addressed to a Christian community of considerable size. So it probably first lived maybe in Jerusalem or the churches in Judea, and it may have included Galatia. It was written by someone who had been in bonds. That, Paul fits that one. And he's somebody who had been separated from the Jewish believers. That certainly explains Paul again. And this is why most scholars believe it was written by Paul when he was in the hired house in, in Rome in, in that first uh, occasion. There are five major warnings that we're going to deal with as the thing unfolds. The danger of drifting in chapter 2, that'll be next session. The danger of disobedience in chapter 3. Progress, the need for progress toward maturity in chapter 5 through 620. And that's the one that has this passage in it that confuses everybody. It has 16 different um, variations of that. And we'll deal with the three primary ones and unsort that for you when we get there. Danger of willful sin in chapter 10, and the warning against indifference in chapter 12. Five key warnings. My main point at this stage is to realize the unity of these. These aren't little isolated trouble things. All five warnings are a unit. They go together and complement each other. Each builds upon the other. Once you understand that, it changes your perspective. Each intensifies until the fifth capstone. They all build up to that fifth one. So we're going to study that as we go then. The writer relies heavily on Israel's exodus as an example of, for individual Christians. The exodus was a failure. The entire generation, except for two, didn't inherit. They were saved out of Egypt, but they didn't inherit. That's the lesson that the writer is going to hammer away on in his letter. Not that's not the only lesson. The exodus, there was a redeemed people. They failed to heed God's instruction and was judged for its disobedience. And the implication by the writer is that's true of the Christian also. He can not lose his salvation, but he can lose his inheritance. So, all these were written to the believers. They do not represent any chance of a loss to the past aspect of salvation. Being believers, they are justified. Justification is behind them. That's not an issue in this letter. The eternal security of the believer is thus established. The warnings... Admonish believers to press on and obtain all that God has promised to the faithful overcomer. This is all about overcoming. It's all about persevering. It's not about losing your justification. The warnings represent a very real possibility of the loss of privileges or rewards that will be offered to the believer and revealed at the judgment seat of Christ. All of us as believers are looking forward to the rapture. What's the very next event after the rapture? Judgment seat of Christ. We'll all stand there. And we'll have an opportunity to be rewarded or to suffer loss. Not the loss of our, our, our uh, um, salvation. No, no. Just because what you are justified, you've got your passport stamped for access to heaven. Access to a hotel does not mean you inherit the hotel, by the way. Okay? So, to whom is it written? The original recipients, were, as I say, were Christians. Each warning is going to substantiate the fact that they're Christians that it's dealing with. And the correct interpretation of this book hangs on the answer to one question. Were the people addressed, believers or unbelieved? Saved, unsaved, or half-saved? <laughs> Being facetious here. That's the whole key that will be challenged. All the way, we'll, we'll accept that challenge all the way through. Two dozen times, the author includes himself in the warnings of admonition. Was the author, was the author saved? I think so. He's not sweating his being saved in the sense of justification. He is sweating his sanctification. And we'll talk about that. And does God urge... See, in chapter 10, he's going to urge um, to hold fast to your profession. Would God urge an unconverted, half-saved professor to hold fast to his false profession 
Obviously not. But that just dramatizes what, I'm, dramatizes what I'm saying. Why the warnings then? Well, because God is love and mercy, saw fit to move the author of the Hebrews to warn his readers. God moved the writer to warn you of these five warnings. The author himself loved the recipients enough to warn them of impending danger. This is a love epistle. It's a stern one, but it's a love epistle. God wanted the future readers also to understand the grave danger that accompanies apostasy. We need to understand that. What's at stake? What are these believers going to lose, forfeit or suffer? Not salvation. John 10. We went through that when we went to Book of Romans, Romans 8. John 10. No man is able to pluck them out of my hand. My father is greater, greater than all. No man can pluck them out of my father's hand. And as I like to, in, in the spirit of Walter Martin, suggest that if God, if you can lose your salvation, then I have a new name for God. Butterfingers. That's, I don't know if Walter really said that or not, but it sounds like Walter. Rewards are we talking about. Rewards of the judgment seat of Christ is the entire issue throughout this whole thing. And that makes it very important to every one of us in this room because most of us probably have a very incomplete perspective of what the kingdom is really going to be all about. We cannot escape this by applying it to others. The burden of Hebrews is not the rescuing of sinners from hell, but it's the bringing of sons to glory. People who are saved to inheritance. That's what it's all about. This raises another issue I want to nail early in our whole preparation here, and that's this term salvation. Among our students at the Institute, I work hard to try to get them not to use that word because it's misleading. We can be saved from a burning building. We can be saved from an unsavory marriage or something. I mean, you can think of, uh, you know, there are all kinds of things you can be saved that have nothing to do with soteriology. Individuals here in this letter are identified as shall be heirs of salvation. A future salvation is in view, not a past. Justification with respect to everlasting life is not applicable because it's a past event. John 3.18, John 5.24. Ephesians 2 hammers that if you are a believer, you already have eternal life. If it's not eternal, if you can lose it. So that's, you can't lose it. That's being justified. Why? Because 100% was done by Christ. You accomplished nothing. You didn't do anything. But by accepting what Christ completed for you, you are justified. There's much more to come, but you have your passport to heaven has been stamped. Those justified already possess everlasting life as a gift, not as a conditional inheritance. Inheritance can be conditional. Justification, not so. This, the salvation here in view is eschatological, meaning it's in the future. That's not talking about justification. You already have that. We're talking about the future. As companions, the readers are going to participate in the millennial kingdom. That's what is all about. I want you to remember, you know, Rodemacher, whenever we meet together once a year at the pre-trib gang, um, Rodemacher usually works, it. he gets up, Earl Rodemacher, he'll say, I am saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. And he says that deliberately to confuse people because he's highlighting that salvation has three tenses. He is saved, he's been saved, but he's also being saved, and he's going to be saved. And what does he mean by that? He's saying justification, that's past tense that's a gift of God of everlasting life received by faith alone in Christ alone. Plenty of scriptures on that one. Sanctification. That's the present tense of, of salvation. It's a progressive, it's a work in progress that involves the faith and the works of the believer. Your sanctification will be manifest by your behavior. Behavior matters. If you're before justified, no. But once you're justified, behavior counts. Behavior matters. It makes a difference. It's going to lead to glorification that's yet future. That's a result of all the previous aspects. All believers will be glorified, that is given a resurrection body like Christ, but some will have more glory than others. And that's what the book of Hebrews is going to deal with. Past tense, separation from the penalty of sin. Present tense, separation from the power of sin. The book of Romans hammers that. Sin need not reign anymore in your life. You have the power to overcome it through the Holy Spirit. And the future tense, separation from the presence of sin. And that's later. That's future. Three different tenses. Justification, 
sanctification, glorification. We encourage our students to try to use those three words rather than salvation, because salvation can mean many things to many people. Justification, sanctification, glorification, key words. They all are the three tenses of a paradigm that we would call salvation collectively. Justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. Justification declares us righteous. We haven't changed yet. Sanctification makes us righteous. Justification removes the guilt and penalty of sin. Sanctification removes the growth and power of sin. Just to elaborate. The readers of this epistle already are justified. It's the future work of salvation attached to Christ's coming kingdom that the inheritance is afforded to the believer, and that, that's what's in view in this epistle. And in order to attain this future, faith and works are required. There are those who are about to, about to inherit are Christians. There are three principal views, theologically. The Calvinistic view, many of you know people who are Calvinistic. The Arminian view, which is in some respects different than that. And a third view we're going to talk about, the partaker view. Calvinism. Most of you that have studied it realize that it has a series, five key doctrines, five points of Calvinism. And all of these are defendable from the text. All of these are attackable. And that's why there's such a debate about Calvinism. But the real issue we're going to deal with is the last, perseverance of the saints. These are memorized by many, by, by the tulips, total recovery, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace. That, that, those are the five points of a five-point Calvinist. Most people are not all five, they're four, but I'm looking at all that. This doesn't, so, this is just a summary of many different views that would be clustered under this label. According to Calvinism in general, all true believers will persevere to the end. If you don't persevere to the end, you really weren't saved. That's the argument. Perseverance, thus, is a test of a final test of reality. Well, the problem with this view is you do, really won't know if you're saved until the end. You see? Because if you make it to the end, well, you were predestined to be there. If you didn't make it, well, I guess you weren't saved. Calvinists generally don't, don't, don't invest in evangelistic meetings, so they figure you're predestined. And uh, th that's uh, perhaps an exaggeration. But this effectively denies the assurance of salvation. Proof is always in the future for the Calvinist. You won't know for sure until the end. That's why some people call that view the experimental predestinarian view. It's only by completing the experiment you find out whether you are predestined. And that sounds like it's self-contradictory, and it is, in a sense. The Armenian has just a different view. He believes that the justification can be lost. Believers are in danger of losing their salvation as a result of sinful behavior. So unless you perse per persevere, you really weren't saved. A believer's eternal security rests in Christ's work and the individual's decision to continue the faith and not fall away. Notice the and. The Armenian, it's grace plus works that get you there. It, in effect, they don't mean it this way, but in effect denies that Christ's work was complete. Works play a key role for the Armenian, too. So there's similarities. Both these acknowledge that Christ's completed work is absolutely essential. Both acknowledge the importance of works in the life of the believer. Both do. They're both similar. They've been fighting for hundreds of years, these two views. But they're surprisingly similar when you really examine them. And these, although this direct opposition has endured for centuries, both of them are dangerously close to the Roman Catholic view which, in which salvation is, is uh, by works, which, of course, we reject. So there's two divisions. Calvinism, their concept of eternal security really being this experimental predestinarian thing. And Arminians, Salvation can't be lost. These two views are considered the opposite poles of a view, of any person's view. There's a middle view that we're going to explore, and that is going to be called the partakers, partaking view. These are the metakoi. These are the ones that have overcome. The book of Revelation has seven specific promises to the overcomer. And my wife's book, The Kingdom of the Power and the Glory, is going to focus on the tools to become an overcomer. And now the overcomer, the partakers, are eternally secure. They're justified. They rely entirely on Christ's completed work for access to heaven. No question about that. But they make a distinction between entering heaven and inheriting. They would view the kingdom as being empeopled by two kinds of people, subjects and sovereigns. Not all subjects will be sovereigns. 
They might suggest that there's a difference between the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. That the bride is a called out subset. There are different views, but these are all issues that will come up. The main point, though, is they partakers emphasize the variation of rewards. And the, the epistle to the Hebrews is a real problem epistle unless you have this third option. It's an awkward miss, epistle. You stumble in it if you're either Calvinistic or Arminian because there's confusion on what I'll call the paradigm of salvation in the front end of it. So we're going to see a composite portrait of Christ, the coming rule of Christ. The, the, it, the, it begins and ends with the coming glory of Christ in the Old Testament scriptures. We're going to see almost every issue that comes up will be dealt with seven quotations from the Old Testament. It's all built on the Old Testament. The kingdom is the grand central theme of all scripture. That startled me to realize that. I've known about the millennium since I was a kid. I've always been pre-millennial, but I never realized that the millennium is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. The kingdom is the grand central theme of all scripture. Read 1 Corinthians 15, starting about verse 20. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when I saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. Why? That God may be all in all. The climax to Christ's work is going to be, uh, be reach its peak in the millennium. It's the most important topic in the Bible, cover to cover. This is the big climax. Now, since this is the grand theme of all Scripture, one of the problems we all will face the reason it's so widely misunderstood among Christians today is the very foundation of this epistle is denied by the churches. They tend to view the millennium as allegorical. It's just one chapter in Revelation and they, 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 they don't really see Christ coming back to the earth to set up his kingdom while well, he reigns in our hearts. No, it's, they confuse Israel and the church and as a whole side thing here, but the fact that most churches deny the kingdom, in spite of the fact we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. We pray that, right? What does that mean? Amillennium, amillennialism, is not a peripheral issue. I, for many years, joined most scholars in this area that feel, well, you can have different views of eschatology, but we shouldn't divide fellowship. And that's certainly... Certainly true. They can be pre-trib posted. People have different views. That's fine. Amillennialism, however, is a fork in the road that's far deeper than just eschatology. If someone is amillennial, they, in effect, whether they mean to or not, they're calling God a liar. And that's a serious issue. And they certainly will have no understanding of the book of Hebrews. There's more prophecy about the millennium than, the, than any other period in the entire Bible, cover to cover. The millennium is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. To really understand it, we we'll re really should start there. The Davidic covenant was what Gabriel promised Mary when he announced her child to come. When they had the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15, James quotes from Amos 9 this very point. It's our inheritance, not our justification, that's in view. That'll be the result of faithfulness and obedience. It fascinates me as I study and prepare this book to realize how it underscores the integrity of the whole Bible. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, he saith, God says, 
that term is used five different times and it's quoted from Psalm, from Samuel, Psalm 97, Psalm 104. We'll do this, we'll hit this as we go. But again and again and again, the root is the Old Testament. Hebrews 2, 8 and 4, 2. The entire position of those passages hang on particular words that occur in Psalm 95. The whole thing hangs on that. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. Numbers 11, 7 is quoted, servant in my house, are key words that the issue hangs on. What fascinates me about the logic here is it, it, the precision that it draws from the Old Testament scriptures. Hebrews 8 is built on the relevance of one word, the word new, in Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Hebrews 12, Proverbs 3.11 is quoted, which speaks of my son. It all hangs on that. Hebrews 12 connects Haggai 2.11, building an argument on the phrase, once more. In other words, what you, what you come away from all of this with is a profound respect for the precision of the Old Testament. And you begin to understand why you don't want to deal with the paraphrase. Because you'll lose that, you see. You'll blur that. You want to deal as close as you can to the original. The testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy, the writer uses types from the model. By studying Hebrews, looking at all aspects of Judaism, the letter was clearly aimed at a people who were Christians, but that came out of Judaism. And fo focus on the background they came from, and demonstrates how Jesus was a fulfillment, in fact, a supersedent of each of those things. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament, basically. We speak of heavenlies. You'll discover that whenever think, something like this comes up, there's always seven uses and seven um, quotes that substantiate it. So we'll just jump in, take a couple of verses, and call it an evening. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. God. God spoke. This is exactly the way Paul opened the book of Romans. Read the first three verses of the book of Romans and you'll see the parallelism. God who at sundry times and divers manners, sundry times, many parts, at many times, and divers manners, similes, remember Hosea 12.10, God used similes, metaphors, um, allegories. These are rhetorical devices. How many different kinds of rhetorical devices you find in the Bible? Over 200 They've all been cataloged and included in an appendix in our Cosmic Codes book. This is the seal of the Old Testament, spoke by and in God's... Well, let's go on to verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. He's just... Spoke, first verse talked about the prophets. God spoke to the prophets. Now, now he, in these last days, he's spoken unto us by his Son. Not through his son, by his son being here. Okay? The woman of Samaria understood this. She understood the supremacy of the Messiah. He will tell us all, she says there in John 4. Prophets versus sons. The prophets spoke in diverse manners. Jesus not only spoke, but was the message. Prophets were sinful men. Of course, Jesus was not sinful of you. So he was sinless. Prophets did not understand the depths of the message. Jesus was the message, right? And... Uh, Prophets did not possess the Spirit continually. They'd come up on them for a period of time. In fact, David can plead, take not my, thy Holy Spirit from me. We can't plead that. The idea that the Holy Spirit could be a permanent gift was a miracle that even Paul had trouble embracing. Some of the prophets were fragmented, partial, and complete. All of these were eclipsed by Jesus Christ as the alternative. This transfiguration. You had Moses and Elijah representing the law and the prophets. Jesus superseded them both. That made very clear in Matthew 17. And of course, Jesus all through this is the exception. Like John the Baptist, the prophets would have to say, I'm not the light. I've simply come to give testimony to the light. Jesus was the light. Big difference. Well, moving on then, we have, he, he, in the last days he spoke unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Wow. Stop and think about what that means. Heir of all things. That's what Galatians 4 hammers away, the first half a dozen verses of that. The son is the father's heir, and we know from Genesis 21 that the heir is successor to all that the father has. Wow. The guarantee of God is absolute. There's plenty of verses on that. We don't have to badger that here. And who is heir with Christ? Everyone? No. But those that suffer with him. Those that are partakers, 
those that are the overcomers. I often make the remark that I think most people that get to heaven are going to be disappointed. Why? Because they've been mistaught. Or taught that everybody's going to rule with Christ. That's not what it says. If so be that you suffer with them. If so be. There are footnotes to that. Yeah, you'll be in heaven. Great. But I think there's going to be tears in heaven. It's not going to be because of illness or sin or anything like that. It's going to be for lost opportunities. As you realize, oh, how we blew it. How we could have. Could have, would have, should have. By whom also he made the worlds. Who's he talking about here? Christ made the worlds. The word worlds here in the, is actually the Greek word ionis, which really means time domains. You say, well, it means the whole universe. I think it means more than that. I think there are more time domains than we have any idea. And I think it's trans-dimensional issues that underlie a lot of our passages. But who made the worlds? Some Bibles will say ages. They'll pick up the fact that it's plural. And it usually means the whole entire creation. Indeed, that's certainly true. Jesus is the creator. That's what John says in his first three verses of his gospel. And that's what Paul says in Colossians 1.16 and elsewhere. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Wow. Well said. Exactly right. That's un <laughs> uncontrollable wow. That's it. You, it's, this, is one, this is breathtaking stuff here. Now, if you're familiar with Paul, this sounds like Paul already, doesn't it? You know, Paul seemed to have a shortage of periods. You know. <laughs> Who being in the brightness of his glory. Whose glory? God's glory. The Father's glory. Jesus is the brightness of all of God's glory. I'll call him the true Shekinah, okay? The rays of the sun are the same stuff that the sun is made out of. You can't separate them. You can't look at the sun, but you can forget its heat and its benefit and so forth. There's an analogy here. But anyway, moving on. And the express image of his person. That word express image is an interesting word in the Greek. It's the word from which we get character in the Greek. It means it, it, like a steel engraving, but it's from that Greek word that we get the word character, the express image of his person. All the prophets and all the writings up till now have been but shadows and hints at the aspect of Christ. But now Christ is here. That's what he's trying to get across. He's here. Handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. Upholding all things by the word of his power. Upholding all things. You think it includes physics? I think it does in some surprising ways. By the word of his power. And by the way, Colossians 1, 15, 17, and 20 enumerate these same things in the same order. It's a stylistic comment. I think it's, again, we see Paul's fingerprints here. The word for upholding here, upholding all things, is the very same word in the Septuagint that it uses when it speaks of the Spirit of God moving on the waters in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, in the beginning, was God, uh, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the Spirit of God moved, brooded, uphold, same word in the Greek, on the face of the waters. Genesis, the second verse of the entire Bible. Upholding all things by his power. You know, it's interesting. In, in school, you learned that positive and negative things do what? Do they rebel or what, what do they do? They attract. Good for you. So if I have two positives, what do they do? They repel. If I have two negatives, they repel, right? And then when you get in school, you learn about atoms, right? There's a nucleus, and there's electrons running around this thing. That's one model of the, one attempt to uh, uh, model. The, uh, and we know that the nucleus consists of right, neutrons and protons. Well, wait, I'm a little confused. Those protons repel each other, right? What holds them together? Well, nuclear glue is a, is a, a term that you use to indicate to your students you don't know what holds them together. You know. <laughs> and uh, then you've got these electrons moving around. You think, gee, they're negative. That's positive. They should collapse in, but they don't because the energy, where's the energy comes? And then you get into the zero point energy, and I won't go into all that stuff. The point is, when you can release the glue that holds them together, what do you think happens? 
most powerful force we know of on the planet Earth. I think that Jesus Christ is holding together. Not only did he create the universe, he, according to Colossians 1.16, by him all things consist. No, by him are they held together. And the day will come, Peter reminds us, that he's going to say, okay, it's over. So it's going to be... Meanwhile, when he had, pur uh, had by himself purged our sins... Now, this is going to anticipate an argument that's going to come up in chapter 2, but that's okay. The Greek aorist participle here is completed. It means it's done once and for all. He has purged our sins once and for all. We're going to hammer this later in Hebrews, that there aren't mullah sacrifices. They're all just pointers to this one. But it's interesting, when you get to John 19.30, the word that Jesus proclaims from the cross is translated in the Greek, tetelestai. It is finished, the way John puts it. It also can mean paid in full in Colossians 2. But same idea. Okay, and then he sat down on the right hand. Now sitting is something that um, seniors do in front of juniors. Sitting down is an assumption of seniority. Get the picture? And uh, so it's a position of honor in Job and Daniel and Revelation you find it. It also implies abiding or continuance. He sat down at the right hand. He, he's going to stay a while. He's not there just for a ceremonial moment. It isn't temporary. It's abiding. It's interesting that there was no chair of any kind in the tabernacle. The priest could never sit down. Their work was never finished. Our high priest is sitting down. I think that's kind of interesting. And... Uh, he's at the right hand. That's obviously a position of power and honor in Exodus 15 and 1 Kings 2 and so on. And at the right hand of what? The majesty on high. That's kind of a tough phrase because it's a compound word that appears no place else in the New Testament. We can just guess what it means, of course. <laughs> majesty on high, I guess, says it all. Well, in just th three verses here, to give you a sample... We found that Jesus is the heir of all things, that he's the son and the, uh, the ages were made. He's the brightness of God's glory, the image of the Father, upholds all things by his power, made purification of sin, and sat down. That, that's a pretty full plate for three verses. And the writer's just getting warmed up, okay? Jesus, we've had a summary here of three offices. The first three verses are a basic summary of the entire book. That's why I've gone this far. Christ's prophetic office, Christ's kingly office, Christ's priestly office. And the, 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 this first chapter in Hebrews is going to continue to hammer away that Jesus is superior to the prophets, superior to the angels, superior to Moses, superior to Joshua, to the priesthood, and all the fundamental ideas that were the underpinnings of Judaism. That's where he's headed. And so... The next verse we'll take next time will be being made so much better than the angels. Wow. Okay. What do we know about angels? That's your assignment for next time. Think about what you know about angels. The Son's going to be superior to the angels in His deity, humanity, and salvation. And we're going to encounter the first warning next time because we're not going to take just chapter 1, we'll take chapter 2. We'll try to get both chapters next time. We're not going to make three chapters a night. That we used it tonight just to get warmed up here, of course. So study carefully chapter 1, and if you're going to take notes, try to outline the Christological implications. What do you know about Christ from chapter 1? Just make a list. You'd be surprised. Chapter 2, what do we know about angels? And what lessons do you draw from the first five verses of chapter 2, which is the first of five warnings? That's a warning to you and me. We need to understand that. We're going to, so we're going to talk next time about the Son's superiority as deity. We'll talk about his humanity and how, it's, uh, how it impacts all of us. And we'll talk about his salvation. Manifest the divine grace to overcome the prince of death and to help, to help us. But I want you to notice the basis all the way through here. Not just the lesson, the methods. The authority of the Holy Spirit's word. We're not relying on this because Paul was an apostle. We're not relying on this because it's the testimony of an eyewitness. No, 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 no. We're going to notice the authority of the Old Testament. 
as a guide to our future. Not Paul's apostolic authority or authorship. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.